Thank you very much, John. And so I'm going to be talking about AR for task assistance. Uh, but before I do that, what I wanted to do is to uh, essentially remind you of something that John happily already talked about today. And that's that we are now this year, 2018, um, in the 50th anniversary year, the first publication on AR and VR by Ivan Sutherland on a 3D head-mounted display. Um, this uh, a picture of which you're seeing over here um, was an optical see-through stereoscopic display, did full uh, optical see-through AR, VR, had two different tracking technologies, ultrasonic and a mechanical one known as the Sword of Damocles. So 1968 full joint computer conference, we were a little bit premature because that was in December of 68, so we're not quite at the 50th year anniversary. Um, does anyone else, anyone here know what else was uh, something that happened uh, at that full joint computer conference? You need not have been there, but you probably have heard about it. Um, there was a picture related to it, um, an early version of something that was shown at it in John's talk. Anyone know? Uh, the mouse was actually used in what was known uh, for many years and still now as the mother of all demos by Doug Engelbart and his colleagues, uh, showing off hypertext and video conferencing and all sorts of really incredible things. Um, and the idea that at that conference, December 9th, 1968, for most people, it was their first chance to see a mouse in the same conference that although it wasn't actually physically there, they got to go and learn about a optical see-through stereoscopic head-worn display. So it's just amazing that those two things uh, at the same time. But now on to talking about AR for task. My lab um, has been doing work for quite a while on a variety of different aspects of skilled tasks and using AR for them. Navigation, travel, and tourism as in this ridiculously bulky backpack that we uh, did our first version of in the mid-90s. You're looking at the 2001 version of it over here with an image shot through its optical see-through display showing some information about a restaurant uh, on Broadway. Um, uh, the equivalent of uh, Google Earth. Back then, we didn't have that. We had to go and find our own uh, satellite uh, photography and augment it with 3D models. But you're seeing a little version of what you would nowadays look at mostly on your phone, instead running on a head-worn display uh, in front of the user. Um, information workspaces, going from outside to inside, um, giving information. In this case, you can see a, a corner of a weather map, um, a little post-it note. Um, interacting with other people and seeing in the space around you information about the things that you want to talk about. Um, medicine. Um, you'll hear later today at the uh, panel on health uh, from Gabby Loeb and uh, Shireen Sadri, who are uh, two uh, medical students actually working in my lab on a really neat application for use uh, during vascular interventions. Um, and then one thing I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today, and that's the applications to tasks involved in maintenance, repair, and assembly of equipment. So what I want to particularly talk about is an aspect of maintenance, repair, and assembly that involves not a single person being advised by an AR system, but multiple people working together, especially when they can't be in the same place at the same time. And one very classical version of this is a person who is a technician who might be quite skilled but doesn't quite have the background and knowledge and skill set of someone much older who might not be on site and who is the expert. So the idea is how can we have a remote expert advise a local person and not do it just by having that remote expert be scribbling literally on top of the view in 3D of the person that they're advising, but by having them actually be able to pick up with their hands and manipulate virtual versions of the things that that person who is actually on site needs to manipulate in real life. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a particular example of this that built on work we've been doing in my lab for quite a while. This is something that we put together for um, VR Village at SIGGRAPH last summer. And our challenge, basically, was to make something that would enable two people, people we'd never seen before, who'd never actually even necessarily worn a head-worn display before, to be able to go and play the roles of a local technician who is trying to actually do a little bit of assembly, 
um, and a remote expert, who's obviously supposed to know a whole lot more, who's going to be advising that person both by talking with them and also, more interestingly, by remotely manipulating virtual versions of objects in their environment. So you're seeing here, basically, uh, our local technician on the left, um, a little inset showing them wearing a Meta 2 optical see-through head worn display, and our remote subject matter expert, known in industry lingo as a SME, because subject matter expert is a mouthful. Um, and they're, in our case, working in VR. Ultimately, we'd probably like them both to work in AR, but we thought it was especially interesting to be able to go and show these two very different kinds of technologies, optical see-through AR and also opaque VR, working together. So what does this look like? This is the task domain that we used in our demo. We were trying to get people who literally had never tried things before into the head-worn display, actually trying things out, and then out of it for the next person in under five minutes. So we had to make it really, really simple. This is our test domain. It's basically an aluminum uh, uh, chassis, um, which has uh, a set of gears on it. There's a couple of gears you see on the side, and the idea is the technician needs to be told which gear of those two gears to pick up first and where to put it on a set of axles that are actually on that chassis. So the technician is going to be shown by the remote subject matter expert how to install the gears in the correct locations. And uh, here is our technician um, getting ready to actually perform that task. You see them holding one of the gears in their hands. All of these things that are important that are in the technician's environment, ranging from the head-worn display to the actual task items themselves, are all being tracked in 3D. Because we're not trying to make a product, we're trying to actually do research. We don't so much care in my lab about how the tracking gets done. We just want it to be done really well. In this case, we're using the same kind of optical mocap technology that's used in movie making. So we're tracking each of these things many, many times per second in full six degrees of freedom, full 3D position and orientation. Meanwhile, we have our remote SME. They are interacting with a live virtual copy of the technician's task environment. We have CAD for all of those pieces. We're tracking all of them. So we can make what sometimes gets known as a digital twin that the SME interacts with. And they're going to be demonstrating, in this case, I wish it were with bare hands, but because tracking of bare hands is really hard to do, especially with people who are not used to being as slow and careful as you need to be. Um, we're doing it with Oculus Touch and an Oculus uh, Rift head-worn display. So how does that remote person do stuff besides just talking with someone? So what we have basically is, as I said, this kind of digital twin. You're seeing a view through one eye, basically, of what that SME sees uh, on the left and also on the right. Um, we have copies of each of these items that's in the environment, the physical environment of the technician. We'll call them virtual proxies. They move exactly as those things in the technician's environment move. Okay? Now our SME not only wants to look at what's being done, but they don't want to simply watch something being done wrong and say, no, 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 that's wrong. They want to actually reach out and grab hold of it and say, here's how you actually should do that. And so what happens is if the SME would are able to reach out, grab hold of something, and then actually move it, well, their motion of the virtual copy they have is not going to really move the physical copy. We don't have any robotics that does that. Um, and so what we're going to do is when that expert, that SME, reaches out and grabs something, they actually make a cloned copy of it. You can see that happening um, off over here on the right. So you can see this is that cloned copy that they've made, this virtual replica, as we call it. And they've literally picked it up from the item that's over there, and they can now pick it up, and they can manipulate it, and that can be seen by the technician. So here's the technician's view in AR. Uh, the technician is wearing a Meta 2, which is an optical see-through head-worn display. We're going to be showing you some video that was, because this is actually captured with a human being inside of it, we can't actually shoot directly through it. So we're using the RGB camera that it has and combining together virtual with real stuff. So this is what it looks like. So that is being done, that, that moving piece was being done by the remote uh, expert. And now you're seeing the local technician try to copy what the expert did. They put that in place. And now our remote 
expert puts another one on another one of the axles. You can see that red rubber band line. They're color coded and they basically let the technician know which thing goes on which axle in case things happen really fast. In fact, here they're just picking them up literally after the fact to show you that they're still connected. If they were to take them off, they'd know which one it has to go to so they don't actually have to remember anything. So what does it look like from the standpoint of the SME? Here is the SME's view. Um, so they're holding, as I said, Oculus Touch. They're seeing this uh, digital twin of the world of the local technician. And now we'll see those virtual proxies that are seen by the SME. They make one of these replica copies. They're going to put it on that axle. And now we're seeing the technician try to follow suit. As the technician gets really close, that replica version kind of fades out to avoid confusion. And along comes our technician trying to get it on. There's a square axle and a square hole, so they have to really line it up right. And ultimately, they will get it right, and it'll be there. By the way, you'll notice how quickly the uh, SME was putting the gears on the axles. The point in this case was not how do you actually get a gear on an axle. We'll assume that our local technician knows how to do that. And so to avoid making this ridiculously, needlessly complex, if the SME simply has to say which gear on which axle, why make them actually really try to put it on just the right way? That's not the point. And so when they got really close, and they were close enough, when they let go of it, it simply automatically went on itself. Okay? And again, if it was really a matter of teaching a person how to put it on, we would not do that. But in this case, the idea was, you know how to do that. You know how to use a hammer. You know how to use a screwdriver. The only question is, which screw do you screw in? Which nail do you nail in? So let me go from that, in which we have two people working together, uh, to a very, very different uh, task. And here I'm going to also talk about very, very different kinds of devices. You were looking before at a relatively wide field of view, optical see-through, AR display, and uh, a relatively wide field of view, VR display. Now, it takes all kinds. And there's a lot of different kinds of displays that are out right now. And one of the ones I'm going to mention, and that you're seeing over here, in fact, is Google Glass. Now, Glass isn't really an AR display. It has a very, very small field of view, which doesn't lend itself to doing the kind of registered overlays that are really at the heart of uh, what we do in AR. And so in fact, you're seeing over here in this inset, um, this is actually shot with a camera through glass, unlike a lot of things that you'll see where people are looking at what look like these nice big information panels in front of them. You can't do that with glass. If you're looking through over here, you can see um, this object. You can see how big it is compared to the person holding it. Now you're looking through glass. This is the size of the field of view that you get. This is the size, relatively speaking, of the hand. And literally, if you were wearing glass and you put your arm out at arm's length and made a fist, uh, the view, um, the image of the screen you'd get would literally fit on the back of your hand. And that means if you're trying to go and overlay on top of this, it's just not going to work unless it's OK for the overlay to be on a little teeny piece of it. And then it has to be in just the right location. And so in this work, unlike what you saw before, where we're annotating the actual things in front of you, here we're making a standalone little picture. In this case, the task being showing a person how to orient something they're holding in their hand to an arbitrary or to a specific desired orientation. Something you need to do if you're trying to find, for example, let's say, some information that was on the object, or if as part of an assembly task, you had to pick something up and hold it in just the right orientation to it and certain something else, for example. Um, so again, what you're seeing is a completely standalone picture. Um, this little bright thing in the center, in fact, is a small scale representation of that larger thing that this person is actually holding in their hand. So I'm going to show you very quickly what this looks like, again, with a video being shot through glass. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the issue that we were trying to address, and then talk about how we can address it both with a very small field of view, monoscopic device like glass, and also with a wider field of view, stereoscopic AR display. So here again, you're seeing shot through glass, a little representation 
a, a particular technique designed to show a person how to actually orient this handheld object that they're holding to an appropriate orientation. And so in the work that we did in my lab, we came up with a variety of different techniques. A number of them were ones that uh, if you thought carefully about the problem, you'd probably come up with it on your own. For example, knowing that to get from any orientation to any other orientation, uh, Euler showed uh, quite a while ago that it can be done with exactly one single rotation, but it has to be about a, a particular axis determined by the initial orientation and the final one. So we have one approach that uses that. We have other ones that, that do a variety of other things that show animation, for example. And it turned out that during the course of trying to make really good versions of this, we came up with one uh, of our own, which basically builds on a lot of the things we know about how to present information effectively. So I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about that particular approach, let you see it in action, um, and then close. So this is something that we call handles. Basically, uh, you're seeing three representations of what it looks like. Each of these is literally the bits that we sent to glass to be able to go at different points in time during the, the uh, animation that you're seeing to show you what it is that you have to do. It's completely self-contained, standalone uh, pieces, um, uh, frames from a live tracked animation. So what you're seeing over here is a set of what we call handles, these little barbara pole-like things that are sticking out of this representation of the object. Very high visibility, there's a red one and there's a blue one. There are two rings, little donuts on the side over here. They're always on a horizontal line, they're always in front of the user, um, and they are basically targets. So what the user needs to do is they need to, whenever way they'd like to, rotate the handles into the rings um, we're showing matching colors. Red handle goes into red ring. Blue handle goes into blue ring. We're actually showing you little uh, streams of arrows that if you in fact followed them smoothly, you would in fact be actually doing that ideal optimal rotation. But if you want to, you can get the blue one in first and then sort of like get the red one in. And if the red one, the blue one comes out, you can, but if you're, when you're done, they're both in, you're okay, okay? Blue one first, red one second, red one first, blue one second. You can try to walk them in a little bit you know, at a time, and you can try to do that more elegant, kind of like uh, moving them in, approximating that ideal rotation. Um, so we have a lot of visual cues, and again, with those arrows showing the paths to the rings. And this is what it looks like. As someone who's done it several times before and is pretty good at trying to actually move it around in the ideal way. So this turned out, uh, when we compared it with a bunch of other approaches in a controlled experiment with low-level details that I'm not going to have a chance to go into right now, this ended up being the one that was significantly better in terms of the amount of time that it took to actually have a person perform the task. Now, I was talking about something being done with glass, standalone view on a small monoscopic display. What happens if you have a stereoscopic system that can actually be used to really do uh, AR. And so what I'm going to show you next is this running on a HoloLens. And so this is basically being done with Vuforia tracking of a uh, heavily patterned uh, box that you're seeing over here. The same technique, but now the handles are attached to the actual physical object itself as it moves. So here the person has to get red and blue in there, they match, and we're done. So um, I've talked about AR for a variety of different kinds of skilled tasks, remote assistance, two people working together, potentially separated by great distances, and also just the system itself advising a single person working by her or himself. And then at this point, I think it's time to acknowledge the many people who've worked on these projects and the funding agencies that have been responsible um, for making them possible. And I think I'm out of town. Mm -hmm.